8 o'clock. So, if you want to take a seat, that would be amazing. getting seated. Give a little bit of hello. I'm Emily Chabon. I'm one of the new co-presidents of Science Under the Stars. So big welcome to everybody here and especially if this is your first time. I'm really excited you were able to come in person. Um, we have one more co-president and she's not here, Allison, but hopefully next week or next month you'll get to meet her. And so we meet every second Thursday of the month during the long semesters, so fall and spring. So there's about eight talks in a year, and if you ever miss one or want to go back and see another one, they're on our YouTube channel, being streamed as of like the pandemic, so the really old ones aren't there, but all the new ones will be there for you. And if you need to contact us for anything, Email is great, but we have regular social media like Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. So if you need anything, just reach out. And so today I'm very excited to introduce our speaker who actually joined UT Austin in my cohort and shares my name, my first name anyways. So she's going to be extra amazing. Um, she received her Bachelor's of Science from Hanover College in 2016 and then went on to do her master's at UCLA and finished in 2019 when she then came as a PhD student to UT Austin in the Hoffman lab. And so she specializes in social things within animals as tiny as Argentine ants that she did before and now what she's working on African cichlids. And so we'll get to see a really diverse amount of species in her talk though and understand how they use recognition to determine how to interact with things in their environment or other species that maybe are of their species or different. So, big welcome to Emily Lessig. Great, thank you so much for the introduction. Um, so I'm really happy to talk to you all tonight. Um, and like Emily said, I'll be talking about recognition abilities across animals. recognition in our day-to-day -day life um, and so we can think about a variety of examples where this is the case um, so for example we can think about recognizing friends and contrasting this to enemies we can think about recognizing family um, and contrasting this to non-family we can think about recognizing predators and contrasting this to prey or non-harmful animals and we know that our senses help with recognition so our senses work in a variety of different combinations, um, but most predominantly we can think about things like sight, sound, smell, touch, and sometimes even taste, helping to recognize different individuals. And um, so with all of these examples, we can think about recognition then being defined as the identification of someone or something from previous encounters of uh, knowledge. Uh, but humans aren't the only animals that use recognition. There's a variety of other animals that can recognize as well. So similarly, animals can recognize friends versus foes. They can recognize family um, or their offspring versus the offspring of another animal. They can recognize uh, predators versus prey, or harmful versus non-harmful animals. And so we see recognition is um, common across a variety of animals, but we can think about why recognition is important. And so we know recognition is important for a variety of social interactions. Um, so to name just a few examples, we can think about recognition being involved in distinguishing self versus other, 
One second. Uh, distinguishing rivals versus friends, distinguishing kin versus non-kin, um, or family versus non-family, distinguishing neighbors versus strangers, mates versus non-mates, um, and then dominance versus subordinates, or differences in social rank. Um, so when we're emphasizing how important recognition is, we can also think about what happens when recognition fails um, so I'm sure we can think about a lot of problems that would happen when recognition fails or when you misrecognize. So to go through just a couple of examples, um, we can think about when you fail to recognize a predator. Um, so if you come into close contact with a predator and you misrecognize them or you fail to recognize that they're harmful. Um, and we can also think about uh, failing to recognize your parents. Um, so in this case, um, we're thinking about Home Alone 2. Uh, so Kevin fails to recognize his actual dad, and so he ends up uh, lost in New York. talking about different ways that we'll be using recognition and kind of going from some more simple examples to some that are more complex. So we see an animal here and we can start by just classifying it versus um, a cat versus a dog. Um, so we know this is a dog based on the picture. So then we can first further classify it um, based on breed. Um, so we can um, distinguish it as a poodle versus a beagle. Um, so you can tell this is a beagle. Um, and then we can use individual information to further classify this animal. So if you know anything about this dog, you would be able to recognize it as um, my dog. Um, so this is my dog, Dobby. So we can use different information to kind of classify something um, and then uh, further classify it into something like an individual like my dog Dobby. And so we're gonna go through some examples of different forms of recognition, kind of going from some more basic to some more complex. So the first that we'll be talking about is object recognition. So like the name alludes to, we'll be thinking about an animal's ability to identify an object based on visual and so we see that there's a variety of animals that are able to identify different objects. And even further, we can think about then being able to categorize these objects. Um, so here we can think about categorization or learning a rule that connects different objects together into a single category. Um, and so we can work through a few different examples of this. Um, pigeons are really good at categorization. Um, so here you see an experiment where pigeons were shown different cancer images. Uh, so some of them were benign or non-harmful images, and some of them were malignant or harmful images. And they were really remarkably successful at being able to distinguish between these two. Um, and so if you look, you might have difficulty actually being able to dis distinguish just based on these pictures. Um, but after training, even these pigeons could kind of tell the difference here. So they were kind of um, amateur radiologists. Um, so another example with pigeons is their ability to discriminate different paintings by artists such as Monet and Picasso. Um, so we're gonna try this a little bit ourselves. So I'm gonna show you a couple of paintings here. So um, in the top we have a painting by Picasso and on the top, on the bottom, we have a painting by Monet. And we'll go through one more example. Um, so on the left, we have a painting by Monet. And then on the right, we have a painting by Picasso. So now I'm gonna show you a few images and see if you can guess who the artist is. Um, so I'll show a picture 
character, and then you can kind of just shout out who you think the artist is. Good. This one's Picasso. Great. This one's Monet. Great. That one is Monet. And so now I flip them a little bit to see um, if that changes your ability to recognize. That one's Picasso, and then I think there's one more. Great, and that one is Monet. Good, so after you have seen some of these, even if you're not familiar with the artist or these paintings, you can kind of be able to categorize them based on different patterns that you're seeing. Um, and so you can see some similarities in the paintings by Monet and some similarities in the paintings by Picasso. So next we can think about relational categorization. Uh, so this is defined as the ability to identify and retain relationships between stimuli and then apply them to novel stimuli. So this makes sense um, with a few examples. So um, being able to distinguish the same versus different or larger versus smaller. And so there was an interesting study with bees where they were able to learn same versus different. So in this study, um, bees were put into this wide chamber. So on the outside, they were shown a picture like a color. And then in the um, chamber, they were matching to um, whatever image they were shown on the outside. And so it looked a little bit like this. So they had a color group like what we see here. There was also a pattern group um, where they were matching to a pattern. Um, so they were given a bunch of training and then they tested these animals to see how successful they were at this matching. And then they also did a transfer test to see if the color group could also match um, if they were given patterns and if the uh, pattern group could also match if they were given colors. So this really gets at the idea if they were learning sameness as opposed to just learning um, some type of rule. Um, so these bees were really successful both at being able to um, learn these um, matching, but also when they did this transfer test. Um, so they really were able to learn this idea of sameness. Um, so similar to this is class level recognition. So here we're thinking about when an organism uses distinctive characteristics to infer an individual's class specific information. So again, this makes sense when we're thinking about different examples. Uh, so some of the examples we talked about before we're thinking about neighbors versus strangers, dominant versus subordinate, and kin versus non-kin. And so if we focus first on this example of neighbor versus strangers, we can kind of think through this as it's important for regulating territorial aggression. And we know territoriality or territorial aggression is important um, for a variety of reasons. So this is helpful for animals to able to obtain resources such as food, shelter, mating opportunities. Um, so being territorial, territorial is really evolutionarily um, advantageous for animals. So that's why we see animals be really territorial. And so for example, if we have these animals that are really territorial and they are in close contact, we might see them be really aggressive towards one another. They might have these territorial disputes they may fight one another, but over time, once they've kind of staked out their territorial boundary lines, we may see a reduction in aggression, they may fight less, especially if they're recognizing one another. And so to this end, we might have high levels of aggression in the beginning, and these are reduced over time. And so this is what's called the dear enemy effect, where we have this reduction in aggression towards familiar individuals. And we see this in a variety of animals where they have this dear enemy effect. And these animals are using a variety of different senses to be able to recognize neighbors. So for example, songbirds are able to recognize their neighbors based on song. Similarly, frogs are able to recognize neighbors based on vocal recognition. We also see chemicals being involved in recognition in different insects like ants. And then most commonly we would think of um, visual recognition, um, which we see across a variety of species. 
if we think um, and bring it back to this idea of class level recognition, so if we're going back to this idea, um, this example of owls, so from the point of view of the focal owl, if there is this individual with a territory on the right, um, they're familiar with one another, they've come into contact before, they're not aggressing towards one another, um, this focal male may classify him as familiar. However, if there's another male on the other side, they've never come into contact before, so he may fight this male, and he therefore would be um, classifying him as unfamiliar. So this would be an example of this um, class level recognition where this focal male is classifying each of these males, um, one as familiar, the other as unfamiliar. Um, so if we take this just a, a step further, we can think about individual recognition. Um, so individual recognition is where an organism identifies another according to individually distinct characteristics. And so here, for it to be an example of individual recognition, again, if we have these owls where we have a focal male, we have a familiar male, and we have an unfamiliar male, if now we had a variety of males that were now familiar, if this focal male was able to distinguish um, amongst these, so he could use individually distinct characteristics, and he could now identify each of these familiar males, he would be using individual recognition. So maybe there are some unique characteristics about each of these males that he's able to cue into um, and recognize them individually. Okay, so we just went over individual recognition. So now I'm gonna give you some examples for you all to try it out. So I'm gonna show a picture quickly and then you'll see a group of pictures and see if you can um, uh, point out which one it is. So you can either shout out the number, or hold up fingers, um, but see if you can I identify it. Okay, here we go. Four. Good, it was four. individual recognition. We're going to go through a couple of examples where animals use individual recognition. Uh, the first is for parent offspring identification. So this is really common across animals um, as it's important to be able to identify your parents and offspring. So one example of this is in king penguins. Uh, so king penguins breed um, in these really large colonies. So there are thousands of different penguins and the chicks have to be able to identify their parents only using vocal cues. Um, so uh, they are really, uh, they're really good at being able to distinguish the calls of their parents, even with a bunch of background, background noise and a bunch of other parents calling as well. And they can do this at really great distances of greater than eight to nine meters. Um, and so they think about this as this cocktail party effect where even when there's a lot of background noise, there's a lot of other people talking, they're still able to really cue into the calls of their parents. We can think about individual recognition's role also in aggressive competition. So here you see lobsters fighting, really aggressive towards one another. Um, so as we saw, these lobsters are really aggressive, they fight, they're really territorial. So often if two of these lobsters come into close contact, as we just saw, they're likely to fight one another. And as a consequence, one lobster is often going to be the winner of this fight and one lobster is going to be the loser of this fight. And so we can think about this as a winner and loser effect. Um, so this influences not only the future interactions of these two lobsters, um, so this would reduce the um, likelihood of these lobsters to fight each other again in the future um, because they have already um, fought each other, they kind of know the outcome of this interaction, but it also influences the interaction of um, the outcome and the fighting of these lobsters of other 
animals again in, in the future. So this is the idea of the winner and loser effect. So because this lobster won this fight, um, he would experience the winner effect. So he's more likely to win fights in the future versus this lobster that lost would experience the loser effect and we would be more likely to lose fights in the future. So we can also think about how this would help to stabilize dominance hierarchies. So as we just saw, if these two lobsters fought each other um, and one wins, we can think about that lobster being more dominant. If this lobster that lost fought another and won that, we can think about that lobster being more dominant than this subordinate. Um, so here we can kind of get an idea of the rank of these different lobsters, so they don't need to continually fight each other um, to be able to understand where they're at in the social rank. So that helps to have this stability, so they're not constantly fighting, spending a ton of energy aggressing towards one another. And so we see a lot of animals use individual recognition in the context of aggressive competition. So like we just talked about, we see this with lobsters. We also see this with a variety of species of fish. Um, and we see this even in insects like ants. And so I think a lot about individual recognition in the context of a highly social cichlid. And so here in this video, we can see each of these males has their own territory and kind of at this shared line, we see these males highly aggressive towards one another, um, really spending a lot of time at this line um, aggressing. And so the males we just saw were dominant, and so a lot of the features you could tell, so they're really territorial, they were being really aggressive, um, they were really brightly colored, and they're also reproductively active. And so in my research, I was interested in whether males recognize their neighbors and whether differences in aggression, um, we see differences in aggression towards familiar versus unfamiliar males. To be, so to be able to look at this, I set up tanks where we had two dominant males. Um, one of these males is a familiar neighbor. So kind of like what we talked about before, um, I'm exposing this focal male to this neighbor. So they're given visual exposures, so now they're familiar with one another. And this kind of goes back to this dear enemy effect. Um, and then the other treatment is with uh, an unfamiliar or stranger male. So this male has been put in the tank. Um, he's never encountered this focal male before. So they're seeing each other for the first time during this treatment. And so we can think about um, how their aggression, the focal male's aggression could differ between these two treatments. And so we can look at a couple of videos that kind of exemplify this. So the first is of this familiar neighbor treatment. So here we have the focal male and this familiar neighbor on the left. And so you see the dominant male in the middle. He kind of looks at the tank um, where the familiar neighbor is, but he doesn't really aggress towards him. He's really spending more time and attention towards the fish um, and really what's going on in his side of the tank. And then we can contrast this to the treatment with the stranger male. Um, so here again, the focal male is in the middle. In this case, the stranger is on the right. And so here you can see right away, both males are at this um, shared side. They're aggressing towards one another, spending a lot of time um, and energy really uh, aggressing and fighting. And so this is what we see when we look at the data as well. Um, so in this first treatment, when we have these familiar neighbors, we see there's pretty low aggression. And then we can contrast this to the treatment where we had the unfamiliar stranger, and we see there's a lot more aggression towards these unfamiliar strangers. So this really shows support for this individual recognition where these cichlid males are able to differentiate between familiar and unfamiliar males, and this kind of regulates the level of aggression um, towards these males. Uh, so next we can ask, how are they doing this? So what mechanisms are involved for them to be able to individually recognize these neighbors? Uh, so there's been a lot of work with other cichlids that have looked at individual recognition, um, what mechanisms are using. So there's been studies that have looked at um, cichlid fish like, like these here, um, and they've used digital models to see 
what visual features that they're queuing into. Um, however, for our cichlids here, this is kind of ongoing work. So hopefully we'll have updates um, soon to talk about some of the, the features that our cichlid males are queuing into for individual recognition. Um, but one thing they could be interested in is facial recognition. So this is something probably all of you have thought about um, and know about where you're identifying someone based on unique facial features. Um, okay, so we're gonna try facial recognition. Uh, so again, I'm gonna put a picture up here uh, and then we'll see if you can identify the face um, amongst the group of pictures. And again, you can just shout it out. subjects, either faces or objects, or faces and houses, um, and the subjects responded a lot more to faces than either the objects or houses. And you can see this fusiform face area here, and it is a lot more active. Um, so this is where you would see the perception of faces, so it's a lot more active to these faces than either of these other um, objects or houses. And this is kind of where it's lighting up here in the brain. You can also think about what happens if this area is damaged. So how does that influence people's perception of faces? So here we can see a subject that has damage to this area. 
and then we can kind of look at research that's been done to see how this influences perception. So here we would look at a control subject. So they have um, normal perception of faces. Um, their brain area is intact. And so you can see um, there is normal brain activity here. And then we can contrast this to subjects with damage. And so you can see there's a lot of difference um, compared to the control here. And so we see that this does cause difficulties in face perception. Um, so again, this reinforces the idea that this area is really important for face perception. If you have damage to this, it does make it more difficult to actually see and perceive faces. Okay, so what did we talk about today? Um, so we learned that animals can use categorization. We talked about pigeons being able to differentiate different types of artwork. We talked about bees being able to learn sameness. We talked about class level recognition. We talked about owls being able to differentiate familiar versus unfamiliar males. We talked about individual recognition. We talked about being able to differentiate uh, parents versus non-parents. We talked about um, aggressive competition. And then we talked about individual recognition in cichlids. And then lastly, we talked about facial recognition. So we looked at some examples in wasps. We looked at crows. And then we just looked at this fusiform face area. So I'd like to give credit for all the photos that I used. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, guys. wasp the same species. Yeah, so those are all the same species and they do have a wide um, variation in facial features, which we're seeing here, um, but they were all the same species. recognize um, those mass individuals, is that right? Um, yeah, a few, a few years later. Yeah, a few years later. Um, I think there's been ongoing stuff with the crows. I haven't, famili I haven't um, followed this too closely, um, but I think some of the work that they've done has been years later, so they are still able to recognize individuals with these masks on. Um, I'm not sure to what extent they have done this year to year. Um, I would have to look at more of these studies, but I think they're able to do it at least a, a few years afterwards, um, being able to recognize the masks. Yeah. How do they condition their offspring to recognize the masks, people in masks? Okay, lots of um, How do, so for the crows, how are they able to condition their offspring to be able to recognize the masks? Um, that's a good question. Um, I don't think that I know the answer myself. Um, <coughs> yeah, I'm not sure. <laughs> yes? Have you thought of trying the Sigwood experiment with the viewer instead of a transparent partition? Um, so have we tried to do the cichlid experiment with a mirror as opposed to um, the partition in between them? Um, I know people have done this. I think there's a few other labs at UT that use mirrors as opposed to um, have two dominant males and they're able to see each other through this um, transparent like barrier. Um, there's pros and cons to some of this. Um, some of them will be aggressive towards a mirror image of themselves. Um, there's also issues with like different levels of aggression towards a mirror image. Um, I don't think this is something that I've done myself. I know it's something other people at UT have done. Um, but yeah, I mostly work with two dominant males. And there's also differences in um, the focal male and the neighboring male, which is something that I'm also interested in. Um, so 
for my experiments, it's useful to have two individuals as opposed to like one looking at a mirror image, but it's definitely something that is interesting. Yeah, so in our cichlids, is there reason to believe that they would use recognition outside of like visual or sight recognition? Um, yes, so there's been studies that have looked at, so in our experiments and in a lot, they're sharing water, so there could be different chemical cues that they're using to be able to recognize. Um, I think based on previous work and things that we've seen, visual recognition would be the predominant um, type that they're using to be able to recognize but it could work in combination with like chemical recognition um, as they are sharing cues in the water. Uh, so I think it maybe is a multitude of things, but I think visual is like a big part of what they're using for recognition. Yeah, so have we tried putting cichlids in the same tank? And if so, what do they do? Um, yeah, so we have a number of tanks where cichlids are together. Um, in these cases, if we, they were together um, and they were able to have physical, physical contact, they would fight. Um, so that's why they're partitioned. Um, but yeah, they would definitely interact with one another. Um, there's different forms of aggression that we would see, like um, fighting um, and then just different border conflicts and things like that. So um, yeah, they would definitely fight one another. and we're thinking about stabilization in these dominance hierarchies. Um, are you asking if there is like some type of transitive inference that's happening or they all need to be able to interact with one another to be yeah, able to? You basically transitive yeah, yeah, so there is transitive inference that some of these species are able to use, um, yeah, based on interactions or seeing others interact. And I have one more question. Um, how do you quantify the how do I quantify? The aggression, because it's not loss of aggression, right? Yeah. What's the metric that you use? Yeah, so for our cichlids, um, the question was how do we quantify their aggression? Um, so there's a number of different uh, really observable aggressive behaviors that they use. We saw them a little bit when we were looking at the behavior, the video. Um, so they do uh, border conflicts, so when the males are kind of face-to-face -face, um, aggressing kind of bilaterally. They also do lateral displays. So when the male is kind of uh, laterally displaying towards the other male. Um, and then uh, we also do... Uh, I'm more curious about the number that you try to capture. I'm sorry? I'm more curious about the number that you try to capture and quantify. Yeah, so to be able... I'm hoping I'm getting at your question. To be able... What is the number that we try to capture? Yes. Um, so we put them into an experiment and it runs for about an hour. And so they're actually having this ongoing experiment where they're um, visually seeing each other and they're regressing towards one another. We give them a little bit of time in the beginning so we're not actually like scoring these or quantifying these behaviors. Um, and so it's right about like 20 minutes in where we're actually taking um, like metrics of these different aggressive behaviors. And so a lot of this is just like a 10 minute observation window. Um, and so that would be like the time frame in which we're actually gathering data and quantifying some of their aggressive behaviors. I got the time window from the talk, but I'm interested to know what, what are the numbers that you have something on the back. What oh, is what is the actual number? numbers for yes. these? Is it a bunch of numbers that you combine together or is it just one number that you pick for representation today? Or yeah, so there's a number of aggressive behaviors that we would see for each 
these males, we can bind those into an aggressive score that we're using. Okay. Yes. Yes. Have you run across any research uh, of animals exhibiting self-recognition versus humans? Okay, the question was, have I run across any uh, research of animals exhibiting self-recognition as opposed to humans? I know there are like primates that are able to self-recognize. Um, I think there's been studies on different vertebrates as well that are able to self-recognize. I'm not super, I don't queue up super with some of this, uh, I'm not super in touch with some of this literature, but I know there are animals that are able to self-recognize. Um, and I think, yeah, there's a lot of primates, some vertebrates that are able to do this. Um, and I think they're uncovering like more as they're looking at self-recognition. Um, but I know there are a handful that can do this. Yes. Um, the question is if two people wearing the same mask came into the forest at once what would happen um, so I think it would depend a little bit on if they were researchers that had trapped the crows in the past they had trapped them Okay, um, I would assume that they would be mobbed by the crows. Um, so if they had the mask that was like the dangerous mask, I think the crows would be able to recognize them um, and probably wouldn't be able to differentiate between the two individuals if they both had the same mask on. Um, so they would probably recognize the like face um, because of the mask and mob them if they were the ones that attract them. Yes. Yeah, so that's a good question. That's something we think about a little bit in my research uh, and that we have ongoing studies about. So the question is, if we had two males that were separated um, with the divider in between them, they were exhibiting the deer enemy effect, so they were familiar with one another, they weren't really aggressive towards one another, and then we moved one of these males into the tank with the other one. Um, so my prediction here would be they would be aggressive towards one another just because now they're not like keeping this agreement of the dear enemy where they each have their separate territories. Um, and so now they're kind of um, getting out of their territory into the territory of the other male, which would cause this male to be super aggressive. So I think they would still be able to recognize one another, um, but they would be aggressive as they're kind of too close in proximity um, and this male is still defending his territory. Yes. Across species, is that what you're asking? Within the same species. Okay, so what is the granularity of um, recognition, yes. um, familiar versus unfamiliar, yeah. within the same species? Yeah, but, but there, can, there are some species which could, even if the animal is different or they haven't seen it, so they can classify them as familiar. Yeah, so from, when, from what I've seen for our um, species, it does take. Um, a few days for them to actually visually encounter one another for them to be able to recognize the neighbor as familiar. Um, what we normally do is four days of visual exposure and this has been most robust for um, recognition of this your enemy effect for this familiar um, recognition of this neighbor. Um, I think it would be difficult for them to be able to have low levels of regression for someone that they haven't seen um, or um, be able to, yeah, reduce aggression even if they uh, haven't encountered this now.
get the intruder for the map. It, that's similar with the fish. If you take the familiar fish, right, take it away for a while, would they still kind of recognize the familiar fish, or how long is the process of the job? Yeah, so that's a really good question. This gets it. Um, the question was, uh, so for the crows, they looked at years later um, if they were still able to recognize these masked individuals. Um, so for our cichlids, if they're able to recognize these familiar individuals at a later time point. Um, so this really gets at this idea of memory, um, which obviously is different across a variety of species. This is something we've looked at a little bit in our cichlids. Um, so after we do this habituation of these males and they become deer enemies, how long they'll actually have this reduction in aggression towards one another. Uh, we've seen this last, um, like a matter of, of days to a week or so. We haven't tested it like fully to see like to what endpoint this would last. Um, I think it would be less than what we would see for a variety of other species. Um, and I think it's also a little bit different when you're thinking about like life versus death for some of the crows, if they're thinking about um, like not being attacked and grabbed, um, how like salient and experience would be in terms of like how much you need to recognize and pay attention to something. So I think it would be variable. I think that's something we really want to look at how long some of these memories last. Um, we've seen so far it's yeah a few days to a week. One more. Yes. How is the aggression of the cichlids with a similar species, but not the same species as compared to the same species? Are they more aggressive to a, a different species than they would be to the same species? Or? Yeah, so the question is um, for the cichlids, how aggressive are they to like a, a different species versus how aggressive they are to? their same species. Um, I think it depends a little bit on the species that they would be interacting with. Um, so our, our males are really aggressive towards one another, especially the dominants towards the dominants. Um, so I think if they were encountering another uh, male that was like territorial or was like large, they would be aggressive if they were trying to like take their territory um, as opposed to just kind of going by. Um, so I think it depends a little bit on the fish that they would be interacting right. with, um, but we definitely see robustly that they're they're really aggressive towards these dominant males based on um, the behavior and the life history of these.